All right, well, we're excited today to be with uh, Tom Brooks, a producer, arranger, an engineer, and a keyboard player uh, for over 100 albums, many of those uh, the Integrity Hosanna albums, and really instrumental in uh, the formation and the sound of Integrity Worship, which was hugely influential in the 80s. Um, Tom, I guess my first statement is... Uh, Knowing that your sound, knowing that you, God used you to help kind of create the sound of American worship in the '80s, mm -hmm. uh, how does that how does that make you feel? You know, all these years after uh, <laughs> being entrusted with that. Well, uh, Travis, it's funny. You know, I I feel like, you know, in, in my in my brain in my heart, you know, I'm, I'm still like a 19 year old kid who just discovered Jesus, and I, I look at I look at everything that that he has done. And it, I'm just right back there, you know, I'm as excited about it as the day it all started, you know, I mean, before I had any idea that being a Christian was going to have anything to do with making music or, or, you know, having any sort of influence at all, I was just excited to be a believer, I was excited to finally discover my purpose. So all the rest of this is like unbelievable gravy, icing, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we just came back from a trip overseas with um, uh, Tommy Walker and, and a bunch of great Christian folks and just seeing just throngs of people in worship. Uh, not that long ago, we were at an event with 750,000 worshipers in Africa. And I'm just looking out over this crowd thinking, you know what? This is like a tiny little glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. Wow. And, you know, you just think of... of his master plan and what he's got in store for us. It, I, I wake up every day just just as happy as the day I got saved. Man. <laughs> wow. Well, you, you mentioned, you said, I, I, I'm as excited as when it all first started. And I think that leads us into my first question, uh, kind of a, a big question, so feel free to take it from whichever angle you like. But okay. in terms of what you remember, how did Integrity Music begin? <clears throat> well, again, it's, it's like the coolest God story ever. Um, I was in, uh, I grew up in St. Louis, and I was in a church there called uh, Grace World Outreach Center. That, that was at the time when all the, all the big churches called themselves the World Outreach Center. <laughs> and, um, and we were doing, uh, you know, my, my pastor was the worship leader, so it was not like two separate guys, it was one and the same guy. So the church that I grew up in, I mean, the contemporary church I grew up in, there wasn't like a, here's the worship, eh, stop, now here comes the sermon. It was all, it all flowed from one thing to the next. And the preaching, you know, he wouldn't put his guitar down when he would start to preach, right? Mm -hmm. So my whole concept of worship was, it's like a flowing thing, you know, and the word and the worship work together and they reinforce each other. So, uh, and even before I got saved, you know, I was doing studio work and I owned some equipment. And, uh, you know, I talked to my pastor about recording the worship. So I started to record the worship there in that church on, uh, on the technology that was available at the time, which is pretty comical when you think back. But, uh, uh, you know, and we started to release those, uh, those albums on cassette at that time. And... Uh, these two brothers that were publishing a magazine uh, got a hold of these cassettes that our church was putting out. And uh, uh, it so happened this magazine was kind of at the end of its course. It was a magazine that supported uh, a group of pastors. It was called New Wine Magazine. And they were kind of finishing up. They were getting ready to close down the magazine. They had like three issues left, uh, a couple of issues left. And um, basically they, they said, hey, Tom, we love this uh, this cassette tape we found of yours. We're you know we're playing it all in the office and we love it. What would you think if we put an ad in the magazine um, for this you know for your cassette tape? And we said awesome, totally go for it you know. And um, the response was like way more than they ever expected. So uh, you know they eight weeks later this is a magazine it came out every eight weeks right. So eight weeks later, they said, wow, you know, so many people bought that cassette, you know, could we try another one? And, you know, the sales went crazy. So basically they said, Tom, okay, this is the last issue of the magazine. We never would have thought that these worship tapes were going to do so well, but, you know, 
it's eight weeks until the last issue. What do you think? You know, do you have another one? And basically I said, well, you know, we don't, but if you really give me eight weeks, I'll just produce one for you at my church. So that's where the kind of the eight-week thing came along. It was just a magazine that went out every eight weeks. And basically they said, well, we're going to have to let all these people go because the magazine's shutting down. Tom, if you could actually produce a worship tape every eight weeks, we would just offer our magazine people the opportunity to, uh, instead of getting a magazine, getting a Christian worship tape. And the great thing about God is, like, nobody had any idea that that was, like, pretty much impossible. Like, if you went to any music company now, a record label or producer, and said, you know, we need a brand new album start to finish in eight weeks, they'd say you were crazy. But nobody knew that you couldn't do it, so God just showed us how to do it. And so we started producing worship tapes every eight weeks, just networking with the brothers and sisters that we knew. And God just completely exploded it from there. I mean, these guys, you know, Mike Coleman was the main guy, not even a music industry guy, you know. Uh, so we didn't have any of the standard record company models or this is how you distribute music models. God completely invented something new for us. And that's really how it got started. Wow. Well, that's that's an incredible God story. I actually have a clip from the very first um, publicly released album, All Hail King Jesus. And I think it would be a, a fun trip down memory lane here just for those listening uh, to hear what the sound of worship in America sounded like 25, 30 years ago. So if you will, let me play this clip and then I'll, I'll get your reflections on it. Okay. Tom, as an arranger and a producer and a keyboard player, I'm sure your mind just gets flooded with, oh, I remember writing that lick, or I remember orchestrating that, or I remember, you know, conducting the band with this. What When you hear that, what, what memories immediately come to mind? Well, uh, the the funniest one would be, if, if you can imagine synchronizing four four-track machines, <laughs> tape machines at that point, uh, without any kind of synchronizer, because they really didn't have them back then. Uh, literally, we, we had to record that, you know, like putting your finger on the button of four different machines with two guys and counting one, two, three, hit play, and it would stay in sync for about a minute and a half, and then we'd have to edit the master and wow. start it all over again. Um, so it, it was pretty uh, it was pretty crazy back then. But, you know... That that was a pretty epic moment. I mean, obviously, technology has moved along. You know, I listen to that now. I want to go back and recut everything, of course. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that was there, which obviously is so much bigger than technology, is just the energy and the vitality and the spirit of God. You know, and, and that's something that, it's funny, it transmits through any technology, Uh you know, obviously, as technology improves, you know, the, the sonic quality improves, but nobody can improve on the Spirit of God. I, I kind of see now where sometimes it's easy for us to get trapped into focusing on getting it technologically right, but sometimes we get our brains so much hooked on that that we forget about the fact that without the power of God in it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like, what does the scripture say about, you know, we're nothing more than a clanging gong or a clanging cymbal without the Spirit of God. And, uh, you know, th there's sometimes where I think we're getting our music, our worship, too dialed in technically, but, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that sometimes we lose 
you know, lose the spirit of God and trying to go for what we think is excellent. We want it to be excellent, but God's version of excellence is different from us. You know, God's version of excellence is spiritually powerful, not necessarily that it sound like whatever's cool on the radio today. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I what I hear when I listen to that is I hear, I remember how excited those people were and how just the spirit of worship in the church that night. So that's always going to be a key. You know what? That's one thing that I've always appreciated about Integrity Recordings is that they've always have this balance of really uh, anointed music, songs that are serving the local church, combined uh-huh. with, uh, I think yeah. Integrity was always known, and I think a lot of it is uh, perhaps to the credit of you and the, the gifts that the Lord gave you, but the excellence in which things were done. And even hearing that recording today, taking apart, you know, hearing this, the stories that you were talking about with the, with the, the actual recording of it, but... Uh, Putting aside the style, putting aside the, uh, the the songwriting, the form, and all that, uh, those recordings are still remarkable. To think that they're thirty years old and they and they still sound the way that they do. Um, so I think it's really neat how um, how you you were purposed not only to to make a recording like you said that was excellent in terms of how it sounded, but also most importantly that it was excellent spiritually. That these people were fired up and ready to worship, and then that that was what essentially was being captured on those recordings. Yeah. I mean, I, I am I am totally happy to give every bit of credit for anything that's good to God, uh, for sure. But I, I think it's it's interesting how, you know, obviously, I mean, God taught me how to do this. I mean, He's still teaching me how to do it every day. But uh, He taught me a long time ago because by my nature, my human nature, you know, I want to be a perfectionist type guy. But you know, if you think about this, so we've got a live recording. So obviously live things are rowdy. You're not thinking cleanliness. You're not thinking perfection. You're thinking the spirit of God. You're jumping all over the stage. The microphone's moving in and out. So when we would go back and try to balance, um, you know, just imagine, you know, you're talking to the worship leader and it's like, you know, you had your hands in the air so you weren't even holding the microphone by your mouth. We need to have that vocal line there. (laughs) So here we are back in the studio you know, re-recording some things and trying to fix something just so the song will be intact. But I'm constantly sitting there and I just felt God saying to me, okay, you know what? This line's not perfect, but do you hear the cry in in the voice? That's got to stay. You know, that's my standard of excellence. That's what God would say. So there's that constant balance of knowing what is spiritually powerful versus just knowing what is technically good and and not being afraid you know there's some places you know i remember where we would let lines go through that the guy's voice just cracked or he just stopped because uh and you know somebody would look at me and say how can you pass that and it's like do you not hear the emotion that's expressed when his voice drops out it's because he's overcome with the spirit of god so yeah that that's that, that's the whole thing, you know, it's like, are you trying to impress your musical pals, or are you really trying to express the heart of God? And I feel like, you know, we always try to, to you know, let God rule, and, and, you know, ultimately, who are we trying to please anyway, you know? you you got to be trying to please God. It's a good word. What needs did you see in the worship spectrum that integrity was filling at the time? Obviously, there there was a need. You talked about how these uh, tapes really sold off the shelves, uh, or I guess not off the <laughs> shelves, but through the mail. Um, yeah. What what need was there? Like clearly, there was a need. Uh, There's a hunger for worship. But could you articulate that and maybe take it a little bit deeper? What need did you see? Did you guys talk about in those early days that integrity was purposing to fill? Well, I mean, in all honesty, I'm not sure how much we knew at the time in the process what that need was. I mean, we were literally, we we felt like the train had left the station and we were literally like running to catch up with what God was doing. But at the time, so we we had done that album you just played and the first couple of albums and we went out to bookstores and said, hey guys, you know, we're doing this thing, you know, would you be interested in selling this to the stores? And the response that we got was, I mean, it's funny to even say this, but this was the legitimate response. Basically, they said, worship, praise and worship, I, I just don't think anybody would be interested in that. 